And uh, with that, I'll turn it over to Pat. Cool, thank you. Thanks for coming up. Man, this is overwhelming to see you guys all up here like this. Uh, oh, goodness. Uh, obviously, you know, for us in, in Colorado, we're really blessed because we have year round fishery. And that, that's the beautiful thing. You know, if we're in the Gunnison Valley, we don't really have the opportunity to fish the Gunnison because it's a free stone and it's, it's frozen. So, having year round fisheries, and that's what we're going to talk about today, is some of these tailwaters. We're very, very blessed. How many people fish in the winter? Just about everybody here. That's, that's really good news. So, anyways, I, uh, I, I want to share um, a few tips that have worked for me over the years. I always tell people that I learn more by not catching fish than I do by catching fish. And I think one of the cool things is if you can master the secret season, so to speak, you're going to be a much better angler during the summer months. So uh, let's begin this party here. So um, some anglers are saddened with the onset of winter, while others welcome the change of season. For many winters of time to tie flies, huh. replenish their fly boxes, watch DVDs, <laughs> and read magazine articles. Others pursue their dreams, tromping around in Mother Nature's winter winter land. Strange as it might sound, winter has become one of my favorite times of the year to fish, especially when I'm trying to seek a little bit of solitude. Winter, no doubt, is one of the most challenging times of the year because of low water clear flow, sporadic hatches, ice cold water, that all leads to very technical fishing, but very rewarding <coughs> fishing as well. Toss in very cold conditions like I experienced last week at minus 12 mm -hmm. when I arrived to the river, mm -hmm. and things get really, really challenging. But like I said, if you're willing to battle the elements, if you want to fish small flies, pretty much can catch a few trout on just about any, any winter outing. Let's talk a little bit about the change of season. I like to define winter to begin with. And <clears throat> basically, when I talk about winter fishing, I'm talking about November through March as a general rule. Now, certainly, winter can change if you're in the Gunnison Valley. I mean, it could be, you know, late April into May. It can still be winter because of elevation. But as a general rule, I'm talking about when the water temperatures drop down below 40 degrees. That's what I consider as winter conditions. So that's a very, very difficult uh, time of year to catch fish. So it's um, tough because of the sporadic catches we talked about, the cold water and all of that kind of stuff, which we're going to address here. But don't let that fool you. Just readjust your expectations and your goals, and you certainly get on a much better angler. Again, a lot of temperatures are on the, on the low 40s to mid 30s. I carry a, a, a thermometer, and it's a very, very important information gathering tool. I like to have the same. I like to have a throat pump and a thermometer. Like I always take the water temperature when I get down there. Right now, down at Decker's, it's been about 35 degrees. Uh. Well, if you're not catching fish, don't beat yourself up. Pick a water temperature. Oh my gosh, <coughs> the water temperature is 35 degrees. No wonder I'm not catching any fish. I find that if it's not up close to 40. Chances are very unlikely that you're going to catch a lot of fish. So don't beat yourself up if you're not doing as well as you think so. Uh, this year, we'll talk about it here in a moment. We've had above average flows on the Deckers area. I'm sure everybody in this room is aware of that. Probably nobody in this room is aware of why we are, and I'll address that here in just a minute. Obviously, uh, trout's metabolism is lowest of the year. Um, at 55 degrees, a fish will fill its belly multiple times daily. <coughs> at this time of year, they might fill their belly once every third day. Okay, so that's what we're looking at. We're looking at this very, very difficult time of year for you to catch fish. But again, it's a great time to improve your skills, mainly because of sporadic catches. Right now, with the exception of the tail race down below Pueblo, you're dealing mainly with midges. And typically, you're going to have that magic hour, maybe hour and a half, where those midges are gonna come off, it's been midday, and when those midges come off, that's when you need to be able to capitalize on those opportunities. Because they're not feeding much in the morning, they're not feeding much in the afternoon, but when the midges come off, then they're driving hard on those people. Very, very important to understand that. The greatest challenge, I think, this time of year is finding a feeding fish. For every fish that you, for every 12 fish you find, only one or two of them is actively feeding. 
so you need to see the fish that are suspended in the water column ignore the ones that are nailed down on the bottom of the substrate because those are the ones that are not feeding it's not hard to catch a feeding fish it's nearly impossible to catch a non-feeding fish so it's very important for you anglers in this room to be able to decipher the difference between a feeding fish and a non-feeding fish and it's very technical because traditionally hasn't been the case this year at Deckers but we traditionally have very low flows so one bad cast one poor decision with flies you can spook the whole run okay, so very very important we've had really um, big flows this year so you might ask yourself well why do I want to put myself through all this misery why do I want to go out and do this this day right here was one of the coldest days I've ever been in my life. It's 20 below zero on the, on the tail race um, below Taylor Park Dam. Myself and John Keefe were the only two people out there that day. That's an advantage in itself if you can battle the elements. I mean, with today's apparel and waders and that kind of stuff, you can certainly battle those elements by dressing properly. And here's a fish that we caught just a few days ago at Deckers. I've had a lot of cold starts this week. 12 below zero when you're when your uh, car thermometer saying 12 below zero when you're driving in around 8 15 in the morning man you start to get a little worked up. <laughs> so but I'll tell you it doesn't matter the water temperature's 35 degrees it's not changing. The outside temperature is what's important. So you gotta make sure that you protect yourself from frostbite, um, gloves, so on and so forth. But the fish they don't care. Water temperature is 35 degrees regardless of what's going on right now. Let's talk about finding winter fish. Certainly one of the keys to being successful is fishing the right water because trout over winter in certain areas of the trout stream, you need to concentrate your efforts on those areas and then avoid the areas that are typically void of fish. So what we're looking to do here is we're targeting the slower, deeper runs and pools. We're staying away from fast water, we're targeting the soft water margins, okay? We're trying to find fish that are stacked up in particular areas that are looking to eat. Again, stay away from the fast water, target those soft water margins. This is a big one here, is the feeding window. I'm amazed at times when I'm driving down to the river and I see somebody out fishing at 7.30 in the morning. I'm like, oh my gosh, all they're going to do is get cold because there's nothing going on at 7.30 in the morning this time of year. Trust me on that. Ideal feeding window, 11 to 3 p.m. That's when things are actually going to happen. That's when your greatest chance is to catch a fish. But, like myself, we know, we all know how crowded it is sometimes. Just getting a hole is part of being successful this time of year. I typically get down to the river about 8.30 30 in anticipation of getting my guide trips and my classes started around nine o'clock. But the first hour or so is generally pretty slow this time of year. Very important to think simple sparse and most importantly small. I tell people there's things that you can control and there's things you can't control as an angler. But for me as a guide, I can control where I fish, the time of day I fish, the size of trip that I use, and the size of flies that I use. Oftentimes fishing a 24 instead of a 22 is the difference between catching fish and not catching fish. And I do carry 26s and 24s. I fish a lot of them this time of year, and it makes a big difference, believe it or not. Then, um, when in doubt, err on the small size. Sight fishing, I cannot begin to tell you how important sight fishing is. In other words, keeping your flies in front of fish. And typically this time of year, those fish will huddle up. You're going to find little pods of fish maybe six, eight, ten fish in a pod with the hopes of one or two of those actually <coughs> feeding. You're going to catch that particular fish and then you're going to move on to a new location. We talked about this. The important thing is understanding a feeding fish versus a non-feeding fish. Look for movement. Look for suspended fish. Ignore the ones that are nailed down to the bottom, not showing any um, signs of feeding or life. <coughs> Selective versus opportunistic feeding. Um, basically, Fish are going to feed opportunistically in the mornings and the afternoons. Middle of the day, they're going to feed selective, typically on a pupa of some sort. So the size, the shape, and the color formula is going to be very, very advantageous for you with regard to choosing your flies. Certainly, tailwaters are going to be your best bet this time of year. A classic bottom release tailwater like this one here, which is Cheeseman Reservoir, is going to be your best opportunity to catch fish. Not to say that you can't catch some fish 
in some other areas, but uh, we'll talk about that here in just a minute. Now, uh, everybody in this room is probably familiar with the tailwater, and certainly the benefit of a tailwater is that we have year-round fishing and because of the stratification of the lake, and we'll talk about that here in just a moment. We have stable water temperatures. My point was working. Year-round, which is very, very important, and this is the big one right here. We have winter warm and summer cool in a tailwater scenario. Clear water even during uh, <coughs> flow fluctuations, um, which haven't been a big problem in most cases, but this year it's weird because at Deckers we've been seeing flows like between 180 and 220 <coughs> all winter long. Certainly um, the tail race is very nutrient rich, which leads to large populations of trout and obviously stable banks. Very, very important. So um, the interesting thing about a tailwater scenario is the coldest water comes off the base of the dam during the summer and during the winter the warmest water comes off the base of the dam so it's very paradoxical in nature we obviously have a spring turnover and a fall turnover re-stratifies in order for this to take place but right now a large percentage of that reservoir is at about 40 degrees and that water is what's coming out of the tail race but in that 40 degrees, it cools down as it moves down river. Okay, so the warmest water, your best opportunity to catch fish is closest to the dam. Very, very important for you to understand that. Now, in the summer, it's exactly the opposite. It's coming out at 40 degrees and it warms up as it moves down river. So very, very important to understand the way that this stratification takes place. Oftentimes, people want to know, when does the tailwater become not become a tailwater, right? That's a question that people ask me all the time. And it's, it's interesting, you, sit, you know, you ask that because think about the Blue River right below the town of the Lady Silverthorne. The first creek that comes in there, Straight Creek, right at the factory outlet stores. So on a warm day in the winter, that can dump a lot of muddy water in right at the factory outlet stores and change the clarity. And there's two dozen creeks that come in on the Blue River. So it can change things quickly. Um, Horse Creek can come in at Deckers and change the clarity. You've got Wigwam. Um, you've got different creeks that enter that too. But typically, like right now, the other morning, this is a look at the South Platte down near Sugar Creek. When you get down there right now, the flows are really nice. They're, they're 180. So what happens then is you typically have not a lot of slush ice because of the volume. Now, when the flow gets down to 50 or 80, that lower river freezes. And we typically have slush ice all the way up to bridge crossing. Now, the other day when it was 12 below zero, the whole bottom river was slushed up and we saw slush ice even with 180 CFS all the way up to Trumbull, which is crazy. So if you've got slush ice, obviously you've got water temperatures that are barely above freezing. You need to move closer to the dam to get away from the slush ice. Otherwise it's gonna be a long morning. George and I fished yep. slush ice up in Lone Rock Campground last year. One of the coldest days in recent memory. We almost canceled it, but we stuck through it, and we did get some fish that afternoon. But you know, when you're dealing with slush ice, your flies won't get to the bottom, and that's where it's very, very. Um, and, and, and Gary and I, we've we've seen situations where I had to break ice out so that we could fish. We laugh about it. He thought I was some crazy whack job. I was going over and breaking the ice out on the South Flat so that we could fish. So, anyways, if you see this slush ice, move closer to the source. Now, certainly free stones. Everybody see the slush ice here? This yeah. is a look at the Roaring Fork. You know, during warm weather trends, certain times of the year, and certainly, you know, later in the afternoon, you can find a few feeding fish on free stones like the Arkansas, the Roaring Fork, the Colorado, the Gunnison, depending upon whether or not you're in, experiencing a warm weather trend. But certainly tailwaters are going to be your best bet. <coughs> That's a fish on the Roaring Fork later in the afternoon after the slush ice has gone away. Okay, now let's talk about matching the hatch. Um, just seasonal strategies. Obviously, this time of year, mainly focusing on midges and some bait flies if we fish the tailwater down in Pueblo. So, I think, you know, fly fishing is a general rule. I mean, you walk in here and you see all the bins that we have. Um, it's one of the most intimidating parts of our sport is fly selection. I remember a statement that Oliver Edwards made a long time ago. He said, the best fly is the fly that's in the water. So what's important for us as fly fishermen, as anglers, 
is that we don't outthink ourselves. Okay, you gotta have, you gotta be on the right page. But what happens a lot of times if you're not catching fish, you have a tendency to change flies all the time, and then you're outthinking yourself and you have downtime. Downtime equates to not catching fish. So what you need to do is you need to put three flies on, have a rhyme or a reason why you're doing that, and have confidence in those flies. Make more changes with your weight and indicator than you do with your fly selection. So let's talk about the importance of, of carrying flies. I think most of you that know me, I take my fly tying very seriously. I love to tie flies. I think there's nothing more rewarding than designing a fly or catching a fly on a, a fish or catching a fish on a fly if you tied or designed. It's very, very. It's the next part of the addiction. I tell everybody. Certainly, if you're going to be successful on any tailwater this time of year, you need to familiarize yourself with the life cycle of a midge. And that means we need to come prepared to imitate the larva, the pupa, and the adult. We're going to see anywhere between three and five broods of midges per calendar year. So for us as anglers, we have to imitate the various stages of their life cycle on a non-stop basis. Very, very important for us. Midge fishing is really only as difficult as you make it. People tend to shy away from midges. They're, they're afraid because they're small, the difficult tippets that are required to catch them. I mean, sometimes just getting one tied on the end of your line is an accomplishment. <laughs> Let alone catch some fish on it. But the important thing is, again, is just to get yourself, have a good idea what the larvae look like. They look like little segmented tubes. The pupa have a robust thorax that contains the wings and the legs of the adult, and the adults look like little fruit flies. And never forget that what midges lack in size, they make up in numbers. So very, very important for us to understand. So let's talk about some of the patterns that you should carry. A, a good healthy trout stream has typically anywhere from about 800 to 2,000 midge larvae per square meter in the substrate. That's a lot of midges, okay? Think about that. How many midge larvae are in the substrate? Typically, they're in three different colors. Pale olive, red, and kind of a creamish color. Those are the three colors that you want to concentrate your efforts on with regard to imitating midges. And sizes 18 and 20. Now I say that because larvae are typically bigger than the pupa and the adults. As they transform through their life cycle from larva to pupa, they're one size smaller. And as they go from pupa to the adult, they're again one size smaller. So it's important to carry your larva a little bit bigger, tie them on longer shank hooks. Typically, again, pale olive, red, and cream. These are referred to as blood worms or blood midges because they can live in low oxygenated areas because they contain hemoglobin, which is an oxygen carrying pigment that allows them to live in the silt, the muck, and the mud. You go to the San Juan, you go to the Gampa, these red larvae are very, very predominant. Pupa, on the other hand, the intermediate stage of their life, typically are going to be shades of brown or black. So for fly tires or when you're purchasing those, typically, you'll see here, we've got uh, sizes 18 to 20, a black beauty. Again, you can get as detailed as you want. You can tie this pattern right here, which is one of my first patterns with Umpqua. And one of my later patterns with Umpqua right here is the medallion midge, which is very, very detailed. So you have... Um, very generic, very impressionistic, quick off the vise, takes a lot more time off the vise, but they each have their advantages. So I like this, just a standard black beauty down to a 24, 26 sometimes. The top secret is my go-to winter fly, particularly in the dropper position. Wide gape, even in the smallest sizes, you have a pretty darn good chance of landing the fish because of the gape. Look at the gape on that fly, very, very important. Um, Charlie Craven's GGB is a good one. And the medallion midge, got to be in the mood to tie those. Um, certainly incorporating the medallion sheeting into the wing buds. But this is nice because it traps air in there and it looks very realistic. That's very, very important. Um, and then as far as some of my favorite adults, Matt's midge is a great one. The parachute atoms, again, 24, 26s. And then clusters, um, the Griffith nav is a good one, 18 to 24. Um, down in Pueblo, it's it, it's interesting. I'm not sure how many of you folks fish the Pueblo tailwater, but it's kind of a banana belt down there. 
And the cool thing about that is we see betas even during the winter on the Pueblo tailwater, mainly because of the water temperature. And it's interesting, even in the spring on some of our tailwaters, the key for betas to coming off is when the water temperature gets to that 42, 43 degree range. And what you'll see down in the Pueblo tailwater is once the water gets warm enough, betas will actually come off even this time of year. So in addition to midges, you need to have some mayflies as well. So Charlie Craven's jujubetus, it's a great one. Um, let's talk, let's get ahead of myself here. So the mayfly life cycle is basically one year in duration. You'll need nymphs, you'll need the duns, and then obviously mm -hmm. spinners. And uh, believe it or not, we see trico spinners clear into December down on the Pueblo tailwater. Is that crazy or what? Mm -hmm. I've seen them as late as December 7th down there. That's stupid. It's ridiculous, but it's the banana belt. It's warmer down there. It's always 10 degrees warmer in Pueblo than it is in Denver. So typically our nymphs and then the, the guns. So if you see little sailboats floating down the river this time of year, typically it's a late afternoon event because it takes all day for the water temperature to rise um, in comparison to your midges. So your midges, their wings lay straight back over the body and your mayflies look like little sailboats. Charlie Craven's GGB and 22s, 20s, very good. Um, style cups, betas, and pheasant tails. Now trout are always looking for mayfly nymphs. They're available to trout opportunistically and they get swept from the substrate, which is referred to as catastrophic drift. So fish are always looking for mayfly nymphs, even this time of year. Go over and fish with Steve Henderson on the Yampa. Your lead fly is gonna be a hare's ear because of the robust population of green drake nymphs that are in that river. So don't fool, don't fool yourself. Um, sometimes you can fish some bigger flies as your lead fly, but we'll talk about that in a minute. You gotta be careful on the selection of your attractor. Um, bar mergers are good, full moon mergers, RS2s, all good considering if you're fishing mayfly waters like the Pueblo Trail Race. And the parachute atoms, obviously CDC bike, compare duns and sparkle duns in those sizes, 23, 22. And some other um, things to consider. Let's just say we're on the blue and uh, it's a warm day. We're starting to get a little coloration in the water. Maybe fishing in a bright attractor, a pink worm, a red worm, trailed by some midges would be a good call. Obviously the shoulder seasons, um, we're gonna be fishing some uh, egg patterns. The nuclear egg is a good choice, the hot tail, a flash egg, or just micro McFlylon eggs are good. If you're fishing the blue, the tailor, or the pan, certainly will need some mysis. Great lead fly in your pen of nipping rigs. So Laney's mysis, Joe Schaefer's pattern, and then um, Landon Mayer's mysis. Great choices for this time of year. Certainly don't see the number of mysis coming through the dam in the winter as you do during the higher flow regimens. Typically the higher the flow, the more suction of the dam face bringing more into the system. But trust me, they are well aware of their presence. We caught fish on scuds last week at Decker's, believe it or not. I pumped a fish in Lone Rock Campground. He had two orange scuds in him. Crazy. And I caught several fish on scuds. So don't rule out scuds even this time of year. It's a great attractor. And I tell people a lot of times, think about how many midges it equals one scud. So there's opportunistic fish that'll eat a stonefly occasionally this time of year. They'll chase a leech this time of year. But we all know that success is going to come in the form of leech fishing most of the time. And don't rule out some streamers. Steve Henderson made a big believer out of me on the Yampa. We'll talk more about that, some streamers. Um, and then leeches, you know, this time of year, go out on the green stream, dead drifting a leech is a very, very productive tactic. And because of a multi-life cycle, a year life cycle, stoneflies, fish Waterton Canyon, stonefly fish is great this time of year if you can find some, some open water. So don't rule out a few stoneflies as your Lead fly as well. Anybody know what this is? Black stone. The winter stone. You go on the North Fork of the South Flat, go up on the Gampa, you'll see these guys crawling around. And like all stone flies, as they prepare to emerge, they migrate towards the river's edge. It doesn't matter if it's a yellow sally, if it's a golden stone, or a Paranarsa stone fly. Prior to emergence, because emergence occurs on land, they move over to the river's edge. So do winter stones. So when you start to see a lot of winter stones crawling around the ice, the perfect fly for this is gonna be a size 18 black pheasant tail to imitate that migratory phase of those nymphs moving towards the river's edge. 
And don't forget about streamers. That is a tip that I learned from Steve Henderson many years ago, as I mentioned a minute ago. Um, I always figured that fish wouldn't eat a streamer during the winter, but he's proved me wrong many, many times. The right retrieve, the right type of water can yield some really good fish during the dead of winter when you wouldn't think that you could catch a fish on a streamer. <coughs> Again, if you're looking for a fish that wants a meal, and typically a brown trout is not going to waste any effort with that, as do bigger rainbows. Again, this is a Yampa fish right here. So, again, don't forget about carrying a few streamers. Meat whistles are good. Crystal buggers are good. That autumn splinter, as we talked about a minute ago, is one of my favorites. And then the leech is good dead drifted, but also stripped as a streamer. Let's talk about nymphing rigs. You know, when I teach my winter classes, one of the most important components to the class is having faith and confidence in what you're doing. Again, I think what a lot of times we do as anglers is we tend to doubt ourselves. And so we'll see, you know, a fella across the way, he's doing really good. He's catching a lot of fish. And the first thing that we'll ask him a lot of times is what are you using, right? That's what you want to always know. You want to know what they're using. More so, it's how he's fishing it or how she's fishing it that makes the biggest difference and the rigging of what they're doing. Typically, a seven and a half to nine foot leader is what I use. People always want to know, do I use a fluorocarbon leader or a nylon leader? I use nylon. I use a nylon leader and then I attach fluorocarbon to that leader. That's my school of thought. Typically, um, I would come down here, I tie on a piece of 5X fluorocarbon right here and then I use a piece of 6X monofilament right here. I find that monofilament is more environmentally friendly, of course, but I've never seen that any type of situation where I can't pull a fish with nylon tip 6X during the winter months. The advantage that you have here is that when you fish 5X fluorocarbon, because it's literally invisible to the fish, you get abrasion resistance, heavier tippet, but in theory, it's like you're fishing 6X because you can't see it. So that's the benefit there. So typically 5X here, a mono here. Now certainly I'm not gonna steer you away from 6X fluoro if that's what you like using. But myself, I burn through spools of 6X mono instead of fluoro. I do use fluoro in 2X, 3X, 4X, and 5X. I've got a blog on my <coughs> website, it's called Tippet it Tips if you wanna learn more about that kind of stuff because there's certainly some different schools of thought. Now, let's talk about some tandem rigs here. Well, let's talk about adjustment here. Typically right here, my indicator is one and a half to two times the depth of the current. I put a size six split shot right here, which allows me to nymph very, very skinny water. And then I can add JP's nymphing mud over that to increase my depth if needed. There's some different schools of thought with regard to setting up a tandem rig. Uh, certainly, one of the most important things is to check the local regulations of where you are fishing. For instance, if you're on the Bighorn, you can only fish two flies. If you're in Colorado, you can fish three flies. So certainly make sure that if you're up on the Bighorn, you're not fishing three flies a game more than you probably won't appreciate that much. Um, so typically, you can come with a two fly rig, come off the bend like this, or you come off the eye. If I'm fishing with two flies, I typically space the distance of my flies out a little bit further. 14 to 16 inches is what I do there. I think there's a common belief or misbelief that if you fish with three flies, you're gonna get more tangled. I don't find that to be the case. Fishing with three flies increases your odds and it allows you to fish in a tractor here and trail two flies below. It's very important though that this attractor, you gotta be careful because your attractor sometimes can be a red flag and spook fish. For instance, if the flow's 40 or 50 CFS down at Deckers, and I'm throwing a stone fly, I'm throwing a big bright pink worm, that's gonna do more harm than attracting. So in cases like that, a size 22 Rainbow Warrior would be a better attractor instead of something big, bright, and gaudy. That's not to say that you shouldn't think outside the box every now and throw a crane fly larva because I've caught a lot of fish on that. But as your attractor, I try to match the hatch, which would be some sort of a midge. Um, if it's in May, I might use a green uh, uh, scud, excuse me, if it's July, a green drake nymph, and so on and so forth, but we're talking about winter fishing here. So typically, a micro egg would be a good choice this time of year. 
Um, very small, I think um, an 18 would be a good call or a flashy mid. Then I typically shorten my distance with a three fly rig down to six or eight inches. It's very important to keep your nymphs and your larva in this position and your pupa and your emerged mergers <coughs> of your trailer because they should drift naturally in, in the current higher. Does that make sense? Always fish your bigger fly here. So if this was an 18, maybe a 20 and then a 22. That's how you want to do it. You want to progress in size. Um, so a little bit about that. The key is, typically we all know that we catch a lot more fish on this fly here because it's furthest from the weight and it behaves more naturally. If we can find an attractor that's consistently fishing, catching fish, you have something there. Okay, very, very important. Uh, lately, I've been running um, a little micro egg, dropping a black beauty and top secret. That's been my go-to rig. Mm -hmm. Now, if I get into some really, really, really slow water, I get rid of the egg and I put on a Mercury Nib as my lead fly. That same school of thought of small is better, Repetitive casting over a fish, them seeing an egg over and over and over again is probably not going to work. But midges, they're going to be a little bit less affected by that. Now, this is a classic shot down at Pueblo. This is winter water right here. Remember, we're talking about staying away from the fast water, targeting the slow water. The biggest problem with this type of water here, this is winter water, this is frog water, is the strikes are very, very subtle. In fast water, everything tightens up really quickly, and we know that we've gotten a strike fairly quick. This type of a situation right here, there's a lot of times when the fish are taking our fly and we don't even know it. You might get back to lunch at noon and you tell your buddy, I haven't had any strikes all day. You haven't had any strikes that you were aware of because you probably missed about a third of them because you never even knew you had them. Okay, so um, I, I swear by yarn. I think if you fish with yarn, you're going to catch more fish. Hits the water softer, it's very sensitive, it's very easy to adjust. And that will stack the odds in your favor with regard to catching fish. Down in this type of water, the fish have a long, long time to inspect your artificial offering. They do. That's, that's where it gets tough. Sight fishing, obviously, looking for the suspended fish, looking for actively feeding fish, very important. But this yarn, it may just dimple. Yep. So the yarn right here, it might just go like this, just a little teeny dimple, or it might do this. How many have fished on the San Juan before? The, 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 the strikes down on the San Juan are so subtle, it's amazing. And if you're waiting for what I call a toilet flusher, you're missing <laughs> fish. Okay? You need to be setting the hook on little dimples, little twists, little slowdowns, and that's how you're going to get fed. Let's talk about hook setting the hook. Um, the hook set should be a firm stroke, but a short range of motion, and back into the trout's jaw. If you're pulling the fish upstream and away from the trout with a 24 midge, our chances go way down. So it's very important that you're setting the hook back into the trout's jaw. So let's talk about, uh, we sell these indicator kits here at the shop. Let's talk about building a yarn indicator kit. It's a very, very easy, effective method to um, increase your odds. Uh, typically, we um, have that little pack. It's got a little orthodontic rubber band in it. And so we'll grab one of those rubber bands. You can wrap it around the forcep, or you can make a loop in the leader and wrap it around as well. Um, typically, uh, four to six times, uh, thicker parts of the leader require less wraps. Thinner parts require more wraps to keep it in place. We'll make a loop. We'll slide that orthodontic rubber band down. Open the loop with our finger. Take some of this poly um, craft cord. We'll put it inside here, slide it up. A little fluffing tool included there. We'll frizz that out. Then the most important thing is a little of floating goes a long ways in a situation like this. So I'll put it on the tool itself here, and then I will massage it into the yarn. You can vary the amount of material. You can use a little piece. You can use a big piece. You can trim it down. You can do whatever you want. If it's windy, clip it down. Very, very important. Um, and then you have the final <coughs> product here. Again, super easy to move. It's tan. It won't spook fish. It lands on the water very softly, particularly in slow water. If you have suspended fish that we're trying to catch, thing will bobber, I think, hits the water very hard and spooks a lot of fish. Again, that's just me. You know, it's like, um, keep in mind that 
There, there's different ways of doing things. I carry thingamabobbers. If I'm in Wyoming and flowing 90 miles an hour, sometimes a thingamabobber is a better option in those particular cases. So I always tell people, you know, it's like this coach runs this offense, that coach runs that offense, but their goal is to score touchdowns. And that's the same thing here is there's different ways of doing things. Certainly we want to stack the odds in our favor. Talk a little bit about dry flies. Certainly one of the most exciting times of the day is when we actually start to see some fish midging. That's really exciting. This is a hole down at Deckers, a downstream of Deckers here. And this is one of those, it's uh, below the second bridge. Uh, typically you'll find fish rising in this hole every day of the year. Kind of like the bend hole up above Deckers. It's one of those places that if you really look for them, you can find rising fish. This is kind of an interesting thing because a real hard seam right here, but then there's a back eddy right here, right? So back eddies present a big challenge. And you can see what would happen if we went over here and stood on this bank here and tried to catch those fish. Number one, we're gonna spook them all. So here, I always tell people, fish always face into the current, but the current is not necessarily always upstream. So in this particular case where you've got this back eddy right here, in theory, even though the river's going this way, those fish are facing upstream, in theory. So typically, what I would do is if I got midging fish here, I'd start in the back and I would work my way up there. If you cast to this fish up in here, you're going to line all these fish in the back. A very, very technical dry fly fishing, typically long leaders, 7X, size 24, 26 parachute atoms would pretty much get the job done in most cases when you're trying to attack those fish. This is an interesting shot right here of a bunch of midges. Um, so midges, they can become very, very selective during that time frame. Certainly don't forget about midge clusters. <coughs> Have you ever been on the river and experienced clusters before? It's pretty darn cool. And so this is a great example of midge clusters here. Um, it, it, it's amazing, um, these clusters. And sometimes, as you can see here, a piece the size of a pop um, kernel of popcorn will break off and a whole that a fish will come up and eat that whole bump right there it's pretty darn exciting so that opportunities presents opportunities to start fishing some cluster imitations so a griffith gnat tied in 14s 16s 18s can be very very important it's also to, um, important to note right now and i saw a couple last week is the big spring midge we're going to start to see any day now. And I'm not sure if you're familiar with what that is, but it's a bigger variety of midges, and they typically hatch about this time of year, late February, um, and it's a size 18. And so it's important now that we're going to have to upsize our pupas to match that food source. So it's not always fishing the 24 and the 26. Now we're going to get into the spring midge, so we're going to fish an 18 on top and maybe a 22 or 24 below it. Does that make sense? So start to look for those. And what happens is, is people see that big spring midge and they start to confuse that for a blueing olive because of its size. Remember the midges, their wings go back over their abdomen. The mayflies have a sailboat. And we won't, other than Pueblo, we won't see any mayflies until late March. Very important to understand. So certainly, um, you know, very technical dry fly fishing. Uh, the most important thing uh, when you're fishing on this very slow water is to make sure that the fly precedes the leader and the tippet. So reach men's are very, very important in situations like that. Um, keeping your profile low, thin tippets as we talked about, extra small flies, very, very important. I think this is probably the biggest and most important thing. Um, when I was out two days ago, my guest for the day wanted to work on sight fishing. And so, Finding fish is difficult, and oftentimes I'll point out a fish to somebody that I'm guiding and they say, I can't see it. And I say, well, that's what Mother Nature intended. They don't want you to see it. They're very hard to see. It's a skill that takes a lot of practice and a lot of effort to get good at, and you, have to, you really have to practice it. Um, it starts by targeting the right water to begin with. So when I look for fish, I'm looking for fish that I see on a regular basis. I'm starting in a soft water margin, just like this. And sometimes in some of the areas that I guide on a regular basis, when I don't see fish in there, it's actually a surprise to me because I know fish should be holding in those particular locations. So sight fishing begins 
with targeting the right water, which would be a soft water margin, and looking for those particular fish. I'm looking for silhouettes. I'm looking for shapes. Have I ever put my customer on a rock and fished it hard? Absolutely. We all have done that. We all thought there was a big fish down there and it turned out being a rock, right? You know, I've done it. I hate to admit it, but we have. Um, but most of the time, I, I, it's dead on. It's a fish. But every now and then, you know, you'll get one. It's, I, I had a rock the other day, man. I swore it was a fish, but it wasn't. Um, but that's, that's the key, is looking for pods of fish, looking for active feeding fish looking for those fish that we have a good chance of catching. Classic winter lie here. I'm looking for six or eight fish that might be in this particular spot. My goal is to catch one or two of those fish. This is the template that I'm fishing. I'm looking for this type of water type during the winter. If I can catch one or two fish in that hole, I need to move to another hole with a similar water type because if I hook a fish or two in here and they're they're scurrying around, my chances of catching fish in that probably are gonna go way down. You'll find that your first cast in any particular location is your best chance of catching a fish. And I think people as a whole, they spend too much time in one particular location. Now, if we have a classic lift will run full tail out that's 40 yards long, now certainly that changes because there's a lot of areas that you can fish in that particular location. But sometimes these little areas, you might get one fish and it's time to move on. But oftentimes, sight fishing, this is a special fish that was taken on the Yampa River that we worked hard and were able to catch that fish. Now let's talk about a few destinations that you might want to go to um, to help get rid of cabin fever. I mean, certainly you can only tie so many flies and it's just nice to get out. And so we, we love getting out this time of year. Um, lately though, I've been questioning my sanity because it's been cold, it's been really cold. So two days ago, it was minus 12 when we got there. Um, we spent an hour and a half in the car talking about winter fishing with the heater <laughs> running full blast. Anyways, South Platte Deckers is a great place to go because it has so much winter water. You can hop in your truck and you can warm up. You can take a thermos of coffee. You can take soup for lunch. Um, again. You don't necessarily have to get there super, super early, um, but it's, it's a great place. And this is where I teach my winter classes. This is where I do all my walk wade fishing this time of year, November to March. Um, and as I said early on, you can pretty much find a few cooperative fish just about every time. Again, got to readjust your goals and expectations because you're not going to go out and catch 20 fish during the winter. If you can go out and land five or six fish, We've had a pretty darn good day. And I think everybody in this room would agree with me that more people have difficulty. They get, a lot of people get skunked this time of year. It's tough. And, and, that, and that's one that just really leaves you shaking your head. Like, oh my gosh, what am I doing wrong? Well, again, take a water temperature, 35 degrees. How many people are catching fish? You see anybody else catching fish? Um, the important thing is, is don't be eating lunch when the midges are coming up. It's actually one hour that you have a chance to catch those fish. Um, but, you know, Deckers has got about 2,500 fish per mile, so there's a lot of fish in there. It's a, it's a great choice. Um, and, uh, you know, the lower river obviously freezes up. This is down near Sugar Creek. But um, typically I'm fishing uh, from Bridge Crossing up to, uh, you know, up Y Camp Road up to TP while there to Kale Hole. So that, that's the best. Again, uh, it's going to change based on the flows. The lower the flow, the more likely the lower river is going to freeze, the more likely you're going to be dealing with slush ice. With these bigger flows, we pretty much have had no problems with any frozen river at all, all the way to the confluence. Now, the question is, everybody wants to know this. Why has the water been running 180, 200? We're all concerned about that, right? How many of the people are going, what is Denver Water thinking? So what's been going on is that the city of Aurora has been moving 100 CFS every day from Spitty Mountain Reservoir to Aurora Reservoir. So 100 CFS is a flow. Let's say we got 180 right now. 100 of that is the city of Aurora's water, and 80 of it is Denver water. And so what it'll do then, um, once they get that reservoir full, according to Denver water, then they're gonna back that up. So they still think that uh, Cheeseman's gonna fill. We got, as of last week, Denver water told me it had 139% snowpack in the mm -hmm. South Platte. 
I'm actually feeling a little bit better about cheese bin being 25% down in comparison to them keeping it up and going through another high water year. That's, that's really weird. What happened last year, and this is, this is my speculation, was because we had such a high water year, I don't know how often you guys take water temperatures, but the water temperature on the South Platte was really hot last year. And what happened was there was so much water coming in Cheese and Reservoir during the high water season that the lake never stratified. Mm -hmm. And the water was warm all summer long. I checked several times with Denver Water. I said, are you sure you're bringing it off the bottom? And um, Nathan Elder said, yes, we're bringing it all off the bottom. It doesn't get any colder than this. And I'm like, oh my gosh, it's 60 degrees in Cheeseman, which tells me the lake never stratified. That's the only end. And, and I've talked to hydrologists. It can happen. It doesn't happen very often. But I think, and I don't know if you noticed that we had water temperature, even going into late November, early December, we had water temperatures up around 43 degrees this year. Okay, now, it's obviously, <coughs> very, very cold. But that's just, that, that, for me, you know, over the years, I've built good relationships with Denver Water, and they've always been able to answer my questions and help out, and I think it's very important to understand that kind of stuff. But again, um, this is the type of water you're looking for. You know, we've got short line, precise drifts, tiny fly, controlling the things that we can control. We can catch fish during the winter, during some of the most challenging times of the year. Again, 6X, 24s, I'm not kidding. Try fishing smaller flies, you're gonna do much, much better. Hey, um, Pat, sir. You were talking about cold air temperatures. It was zero when you got that in the water. I know the water temperature itself is consistent, but what do you do to keep your line from freezing over there? Get that straw ice on the whole line. There's really not much you can do. And I, people ask me that every day. They're like, um, what do you do? You know, there, there was a product that was called Stanley's Ice Off. I've never found anything that works, to be honest with you. I just chip it out. I just, I take it, when I get ice in there, it's just like wiggle the tip down in the water, try to get it out. Be careful you don't break the tip, but there, there, that's just part of it. It just comes with the territory. And I wish there was something, you know, some people say, oh, I'll spray Pam on it and this, that. I mean, I'm not going to take a $100 fly line and spray Pam on it. I'm sorry. I'm not going to do that. <laughs> but, um, <laughs> I just, I chip it out. You know what I mean? I just chip it out. And it's just, it's a, it's a maintenance nightmare. But you got to do it. And then, you know, you hope that you get above 30 degrees and you don't have to fiddle around chipping out all the ice. But, um, you know, it's cold like the other day when your fly line freezes. You know, when you start getting a big chunk of ice on your fly line, that's when it's cold. Um, but the cool thing is, you know, what I'll do is on these cold mornings, I'll, I'll get there, I'll put my rod on top of my car, and I'll crack my window, and I'll bring my fly line in my window, and I'll tie my rig in there, and then I'll get out and go after it. If you get cold, right now, your feet will feel like two stumps, I'm telling you. Your feet are cold. Very, very, very cold. But the water temperature is 35, so the fish don't really, they don't, they don't really know any different, you know what I mean? Um, but there's some opportunities, again, to catch some of the bigger fish this time of year. Again, remember, as a general rule, lower flows, which opens up some opportunities to sight fish, to target some of these bigger fish that we don't, we can't catch them at 900 CFS because they're spread out. Lower water, we can target some of these bigger fish. That particular fish um, ate a crane fly in a fast, deep slot. So, again, there are times and if you don't have any of Joe Schaefer's crane flies, you should carry a few of those because sometimes it does pay to think outside the box in particular holes like this one here, which is in the rock garden. It's a fast slot. Remember, because it's fast on top doesn't mean that if there's structure below, that there's not fishing holding down there. And that happens from time to time. Um, great time again. Um, solitude. It's amazing. It's like I've been out I've, the last 10 days, and, you know, I mean, it's obvious why there's nobody there, but I mean, it's crazy. I, I mean, I've been down there and there hasn't been hardly a soul at that, but it's been cold. It's been really, really cold, but it's so beautiful this time of year. We have some opportunities to catch some very, very nice fish. Don't forget about Cheeseman. Um, I don't do as much fishing in Cheeseman, but there are some opportunities as well to catch some bigger fish this time of year. But certainly it's a little bit more treacherous, a little bit more difficult, but certainly hiking up closer to the dam increases your opportunity of finding more feeding fish. And it's something to think about. And there certainly are some lovely, lovely fish to be had in that canyon. The Taylor River. 
Del River is is a great time of year. Mm -hmm. I talked to um, to fish it. I talked to a friend of mine, Jay Hill, who lives over in the Gunnison Valley, and he's like, "This is why I live in Gunnison." He goes, "I fished the Taylor Day, and there was only two people." And I'm like, "Yeah, it was probably 20 below too." Um, but the Taylor is a, is a great place to go. Um, as in this photograph here, it was 20 below, um, and I was over giving a talk to the Sockeyes, which is a as a club over there in uh, Western State, and. Uh, we got in there the night before and I wanted to try to fish a little bit that day and um, this particular day myself John keep over I showed a picture of that earlier um, we were only two guys on the river the whole day that day but it was very very cool and certainly um, there's trade-offs and compromises associated with fishing in 20 degrees well zero um, very very cold certainly uh, protect yourself from frostbite so so forth. but there's certainly plenty of warm days as we all know plenty of bluebird days um, yesterday would have been a great day to be down at Deckers. Probably a lot more people yesterday down there. I was actually off because I had to go to the dentist. But um, I, uh, we see plenty of these days where we get... Mm -hmm. I had a day on Tuesday where it was 38 degrees. I mean, those are balmy. You know what I mean? You just, you're loving life when it gets all the way up to 38. <laughs> but, uh, and there's certain days like that, or even over in the Gunnison Valley, where you have those days where you have those nice days. And certainly, um, there's a big fat fish there. Look at all the snow. Um, that's a fish that's ate a lot of mysis in its day, right there. So typically, you know, mysis trailed by two pupa. Good choice this time of year if you're going to fish the Taylor. Uh, I, I've, I've been on the Taylor many times where I was the first person up that County Road 742 pushing snow with my bumper. I mean, they get a lot of snow in that, in that valley. But again, if you uh, go out on those nasty days, Chances are pretty good that you're going to definitely enjoy some solitude. This is a shot um, on the Taylor, uh, you know, the third week of May. So you can see, again, in elevation, it's still winter. There's been still snow. I mean, last year we had snow in Steamboat Springs on the 20th of June. You guys remember that? Mm -hmm. 20 inches of snow. So, I mean, certainly the winter season is going to last much longer in areas like the Taylor. Charlie Myers Wildlife Area, this is just starting to heat up right now. We're starting to see that first wave of migratory fish that are entering into the system. Um, the resident fishing hasn't been as good from that flood that occurred there last year, the flood and the hail and all that stuff. You guys are familiar with that. There's been a lot of sedimentation, particularly near the inlet. And I think that's why the fish are a little slower this year coming into the system. Um, but it's that time of year, typically mid-February to mid-April, is when we start to see some of those fish move into the system. And we have opportunities, of course, to target some of these lake run fish. Um, so it's an opportunity to get out. Certainly it's not easy fishing, but it's an opportunity to get some of the bigger ones. So you've got migratory fish, um, as well as some of the resident fish in there. And certainly uh, between November and the latter part of March, there are some opportunities to catch some very impressive fish here at the Green Stream. Particularly these migratory fish. So a lot of egg midge combos this time of year. Um, I fish a lot of red larva midge combos. That's pretty much my rig of choice out there. Uh, certainly this time of year, very, very cold. You, know, you get those you know, 15, 20 degree wind chill factor days out there as well. Throw in the wind. And you, you know it gets it gets pretty pretty brutal out there, but there's again some opportunities. Um, the crowds haven't been too bad out there. Have a little solitude, enjoy a little peace and quiet. Right now, there's quite a bit more snow. Pretty much the whole um, floor of the South Park Valley is under snow right now, so they've been getting a fair amount of snow out of there. Some opportunities to catch some nice cutties. But certainly. Um, you know, two hour drive, we have an opportunity to get some pretty decent fish. I love Mile Canyon, another good option in the winter. Um, the interesting thing about Love Mile Canyon, because it's a top release reservoir, only about a mile and a half of that water remains fishable. Have you ever noticed that when you've been in the Love Mile Canyon, that the lower river's all frozen? Remember we talked a little bit ago about the coldest water, and the tail water is going to be on the top this time of year and the warmest is on the bottom. So being top release, in conjunction with some water coming off the bottom, it is going to 
to much colder. Love Mile Canyon is a, a very, very frigid place, just like Cheeseman Canyon. That's a lot of the reason why I don't fish Cheeseman as much. I love Mile Canyon is very similar because so much of it is weather locked. When I'm at Deckers, I can stay in the sun and I can stay warm. That's the beautiful thing. Is a lot of times, like when it, two days ago when it was 12 below zero, I told my customers we're staying in the sun. We're not going to fish in the shade because it's five to ten degrees colder in the shade. So the beautiful thing is, is if you can stay in the sun, it certainly helps you out quite a bit. But I had I had a guy and a gal out and they were troopers, man. They they really hung in there for me. But uh, you know, 11 mile again, if you target the you know that upper section. You've got an opportunity to catch some beautiful cutthroats, uh, some rainbows, and some brown trout. Again, if you can stay in some of these sunny areas, it is a heck of a lot more comfortable. And one of the cool things about a Love Mile Canyon is, is uh, the opportunity to catch fish on dry flies, even in the winter. That's what I like about it. So if you really look for them, particularly in those shaded areas, you will find some, some midgen fish. So they keep that road halfway decent. Pretty decent, yeah. <laughs> You know, it, it's kind of like that, that that road and the Deckers Road, it concerns me at times because people drive too fast. I mean, I had a guy about wrecked, you know, the, the other day. I, I, on a lot of those curves, man, I really slow down because people come barreling out of there. So be careful on that. Um, they, there's some spots that can get slick at times. Mm -hmm. But uh, certainly, um, again, it's, it's a great place to be, particularly this time of year now when we're starting to see the midge fishing really pick up in there as well. So mid-February, again, be on the lookout for those midges. You'll see them. If you're going to be out on the river, you're going to start to see those, those bigger midges. So a lot of Hofer rainbows in 11 Mile Canyon. They don't have the real pronounced color that we see with Deckers and Cheeseman, but these are beautiful little fish, cookie cutters, a lot of those 12, 14 inch fish. The North uh, Fork of the South Platte, um, depending upon uh, whether or not the Robert's Tunnel is on, which is, I think, Denver Water, they didn't say this the other day, but I think they're probably wishing they would have left it on this year because we had such a drought early on. And it's been weird. I mean, we had no moisture at all. And now we have an excessive amount of moisture. But if the Roberts Tunnel is on, then certainly this fishery can come into play. We do a lot of winter classes down there. We do a lot of our corporate trips down in there. We have several leases on there. There is some public access as well in and around Shawnee area. Got the Jefferson County open space, um, and depending upon how low it is, um, it depends upon the flows, uh, whether you have frozen water or not. But um, Boxwood Gulch, where this fish was taken, has some unusually large fish. Again, it's another option um, that we provide. You can see here, um, even during some of the coldest times, we have open water, but certainly a lot of slush ice and stuff to contend with. These fish um, predominantly feeding on midges this time of year. It's a lot of egg midge combos. Um, very, very effective method of approaching those fish. Again, short window. You know, the Roberts Tunnel in, in many ways acts like a tailwater because the water's coming off uh, the base of the Dillon Dam. Uh, natural flow is only about 20, so without that flow, this is completely uh, weather locked. But again, it's a um, nice little stretch of water, enjoyable to get out. Um, get your feet wet, not literally, but get your feet wet, catch a few fish on midges. Um, can be a very, very enjoyable time. And even late November on some of these warm days, um, you know, you got to love days like this. Like, I think uh, yesterday, what was the temperature? It must have been about 50 degrees. You know, I mean, lovely day. You get a few of those days, you know, you have an opportunity to do some, some fishing. And uh, November, certainly, a um, great time to fish streamers in that particular section with the distinct possibility of catching some very, very large fish. Nymphing, obviously, is one of the most productive methods. Yeah. But variety of game fish, too. You know, you see brown trout, you see brookies, um, palominos, the whole gamut. We talked a lot about this one now. So I think this, uh, the Arkansas tailwater, is, is a good one. It gets a lot of pressure, don't get me wrong. But um, this is a great fishery. Um, during the winter, uh, typically I like flows that are in that 70 to 130 CFS range. I think that's kind of the sweet spot. Sometimes, you know, in November we can see flows up as high as 300. That's a little high for my liking, but this is a lovely little tailwater, a little bottom of this tailwater you can see right here below the dam. But um, it, it's, it's beautiful. I typically concentrate my efforts from the nature center, which is close to Pueblo Boulevard, up to the dam. That, that's the particular stretch. 
that I like. Um, it's hard to go wrong with that nature center and that Balco bridge section there. Um, there is a, a fair amount of um, catchables put in. Uh, at one point in time, there was 30,000 catchables put in this section. I don't know what the, the rate is now, but um, these fish that hold over are very, very impressive. So you have a lot of small fish, but you have some very, very impressive fish as well. I don't think they're stocking it as much as they once were because I think there's so many fish in there and there's obviously some very big fish in there. I don't know if you saw some of the big browns that were coming out of there this past fall. There were some very, very large brown trout as well. So this is right around the Valco Bridge. Typically I run a red larva and drop a couple of midges off of it. Um, we talked about mayfly hatches, trichos clear into December, olives this time of year, <clears throat> which you, you think you're seeing things down there. Um, you're seeing olives in the afternoon, but it, trust me, it's usually going to be late afternoon when the water temperature rises up, as we discussed a moment ago, uh, to that 42, 43 degree range. So, um, again, another option, a lot of stream restoration work has been done in there. If it looks fishy, it generally is. Um, target the frog water again. Um, there's a lot of slow water in there, and that's where these fish are sitting. There's some of that lake-like, um, very slow-moving water. But there's some great fish in there. I would encourage you, if you haven't been down there, go down there, check it out. Like I said, it's always a little bit warmer down in there. Uh, certainly not the uh, bulk of the biomass, but there are some nice brown trout in this particular section as well. Pat, have they put some restrictions in there yet? I don't believe they have. I, I, I don't think they have yet, Greg. Right? They're working on that. They need to. Um, they need to. Because it, it does break your heart when you're walking down and you see a 20 inch rainbow on a string in there and that kind of oh. messes up your day a little bit but um, again oh. if you don't go down there I would encourage you to go down there uh, the Yampa this the Yampa River is uh, one of my favorites I, I make it a point to get over to the Yampa at least once in the winter every year now I mean travel can be a little tough at times but last week I think they got 50 some inches on rabbit ears uh -huh. uh, if you've ever gone over there you can know how challenging that can be. I know you go over there quite a bit, Gary, fish with Steve. Um, but uh, if, you, if you want to treat yourself to a great day on the water, um, go out with this man right here, Steve Henderson. He runs a company called, and we've had Steve come out and talk, um, uh, Henderson Fly Fishing. But he has a lot of access to private water and can take you on a snowmobile. I've photographed that here in a minute. But um, it, it, it's really fun to, to fish the, the Yampa tailwater. Um, certainly, uh, there's plenty of access right in the town of Steamboat Springs. Um, you've got 13th Street Bridge right here. You can see the springs coming in right in downtown Steamboat Springs. And it, it's pretty amazing what is right there in downtown Steamboat Springs. I don't know how many of you have ever fished that, but it's crazy. I mean, if, you, if, you, if you're staying at, at the Holiday Inn or something and you just want to go out and fish a couple hours, I mean, take a look at Landon's pants there, man. You tell me if it's cold out there or not. You know, I mean, it, his, his waders are frozen. But... <laughs> You can go out, um, fish for a couple hours, go warm up, get a cheeseburger, etc. Um, you know, it's a great option right in town itself. Um, but one of my favorite things to do is to go out with Steve um, and then just go into some of these areas um, above and below Catamount, or potentially even up around Stagecoach. So they call the Stagecoach the actual true tailwater, and then below that is Catamount. And sometimes of the year, that's um, a bottom release and sometimes it's top release depending upon the areas. Um, but it's not a true tailwater like the stagecoach section, which this is here. Billy Atkinson with Colorado Parks and Wildlife did a really nice stream restoration project in there in this particular section below stagecoach. Um, I don't know what the current biomass is, but it was upwards around 5,000 fish per mile, so it was very, very healthy. Uh, beautiful fish, a lot of rising fish, if you like technical dry fly midging type stuff. Again, this is public water here. But you have to be able to get to it, which is not easy during the winter. You can't, you know, in the summer you can drive in. This time of year, obviously, the only way you can get in there is with a snowmobile. Uh, we talked about that hairs. Um, when I did Colorado guide flies, that was probably one of the most rewarding projects that I did was being able to go to the best guides in the state of Colorado and get their most productive fly. Steve Henderson's favorite fly is a hairs here. And if you fish the green drink hatch on the Gampa, you'll know why. But Keep in mind, um, we're aware of their presence year-round. Steve uses a, a hare's ear with a tungsten bead as his lead fly most of the year. And you'd probably agree with me on that, Gary. He loves that fly. Um, it's a great fly. So 
he'll, he'll take that and he'll drop it off. And um, there's some great opportunities. This is a this is a picture of the Kuntz Ranch, which is above uh, the reservoir there. And uh, migratory fish. One of my favorite times is that mid March um, time frame there above Catamount because of those migratory fish that enter the system. And uh, that fish there was caught on my son's Manhattan midge, which is a great little midge pattern. You may or may not have heard of it, but it's a uh, really combines three attributes of the mercury black beauty, the mercury blood midge, and the top secret midge kind of all into one pattern. This is the Chuck Lewis State Wildlife Area. Um, again, a public access area, um, not too far outside of Steamboat Springs. So it's another nice option. In fact, you can see the ski area in the backdrop there. So that gives you an idea of how close you are uh, to that particular area. Certainly, um, Steamboat Valley, they don't fiddle around over there when it comes to snow. You know, usually a lot of snow. Um, a lot of the barbed wire fences are completely buried mm. this time of year. So that's good. They're getting, they're getting plenty of snow. Again, I, I talked a little bit about um, streamer fishing. You know, Steve was the guy that really opened up my eyes um, with regard to streamer fishing. And with the right retrieve, the right water, he always catches fish. And that's cool. And it's something that we don't do a lot is think outside the box and try to catch some of those fish on streamers. But it is an opportunity to catch some bigger fish, some of these undercut uh, snow banks, so on and so forth. The frying pan is another destination, obviously um, close enough. Um, to do a day trip, but like uh, the Yampa, it's, it's better to try and make a mini vacation out of it, do a two day trip. Um, go over to the pan. Uh, this picture of Will Sands, who is the manager at Taylor Creek Fly Shop, another contributor to Colorado Guide Flies. Um, his Mysis pattern, Sands Mysis, is one that you should carry in your arsenal of flies. But uh, certainly fishing with Will is always a treat. Uh, he's been there for a long time and, and uh, certainly a, a very good. Um, knowledge and, and wealth of um, knowledge there. Um, this particular fish with full on sands mysis. Um, certainly, um, right now there's a lot more snow over there than that, but um, mysis patterns, the most important thing is that black eyeball. <coughs> Typically, 18s, 20s, 22s on the mysis, again, trailing some smaller. Implications. If the upper river gets crowded, which it often does from the bridge pool to the dam, don't rule out dropping down into some of the lower stuff. Um, that's one of the biggest challenges when the flying pan is access. So you need to know where you are and know whether or not you want to stay away from obviously the private property there. So uh, there's 13 miles of river access. Know what's private and what's not. Again, some of the best days to be out there are these days here where you're questioning your sanity. Uh, you get your buddy to hold a fish. Steve Miles is not happy about this. <laughs> but certainly, again, plenty of bluebird days. This is a late November day um, when the betas are coming off. This is a really memorable day for me. Uh, in the shade, olives coming off, and nothing will warm me up more than catching a few fish on dry flies during the winter months. So, uh, here you go. This is a look at uh, the flats down in the Ben Pool. Very very popular winter hole. Again, these are the days that you see a little solitude. Craziness sometimes. Blue River, a little bit closer to home. And over the years, I've had a love-hate relationship with the Blue River. And um, so many sections of the Blue River have lost their gold medal designation. Uh, gold medal is 60 pounds of trout per acre with 12 or more over 14 inches. The section in town, though, the four miles of river below the dam is still considered gold medal. So that's important. Um, easy one day trip. I think most of us that have fished it, we know how crazy this is. Uh, you know, the factory outlet store is right here. And we have restaurants with all kinds of stuff going on in and around, but we have a gold medal trout stream coming out of the base of Dillon Dam. It's really something for everybody. You know, if you want to fish for a couple hours, you want to ski a little bit. We really have it all here. But, uh, again, it's a mysis fed fishery. So, mysis trailed with red larva, black beauties, small fish, um, or small flies. Sight fishing is critical on this river. You got to keep your flies in front of fish. And it's one of the harder rivers to see fish because the substrate has a lot of different colored boulders in it. A tan one, a green one, a red one. It's very difficult to sight fish. I think it's one of the more challenging. But, and there's some great, great fishing we had. I mean, it's crazy. There's a run right in front of the Ford dealership there. It's one of my favorite runs in the whole area. 
and you'll find rising fish in that almost every day during the winter. Crazy, it's right above 7 Eleven there. Um, so there's some opportunities to catch some of these big, fat, healthy rainbows that are eating mice or shrimp. And when they're not eating mice or shrimp, they're just tailwater trout. And that's what's important to understand. <coughs> this is right down um, near Town Hall. A lot of times I'll park my car down at Town Hall, which is where the library and the police station is, and then I'll work my way up. This section gets a lot less pressure than up near the dam. So that's kind of a cool thing just to park here and just work your way up to the dam. There's miles of water there, as I mentioned. It's an opportunity to catch some, some great fish in there. As the spring season starts to unfold, um, then you can start dropping down um, towards the lower river. You know, you get Eagle's Nest, um, Palmer Gulf, and it really depends upon the time of year, you know, how much snow, <coughs> water temperatures, and so on and so forth, uh, when those particular stretches are going to open up. Now, every now and then, you know, I get craziness in my blood, and I like to just do um, some, some other little mini vacations. Next week, I'm going to Texas for Trout Fest, so I'm going to get to fish the Guadalupe. Um, that's fun. We'll talk about that in a second. But the bighorn is never out of reach. Um, fly up to Billings, rent a car, drive down to Fort Smith. Uh, the bighorn is in a bit of a uh, challenging time. I'm sure you all heard all the negative buzz about the bighorn. Fish populations are down to about 2,500 fish per mile, so there's way less fish. Hardly any pressure on the big one right now because it's got a negative buzz about what's going on. The fish are big up there right now. So when you have fewer fish, they tend to get bigger. And, uh, you know, I'm pretty good buddies with the guys up at the Bighorn Trout Shop. And I just saw them at a trade show last week. And I said, what's going on with the big one? I mean, don't, don't be asking. I want to know, what, you know. But so way fewer fish from a series of high water years. But just like the Blue River, you only need one fish at a time. That's the way I tell people. <laughs> so Bighorn is a great fishery in the winter, like I said. Um, driving can be a little bit iffy this time of year. If you've ever been up there going through um, Wyoming with Casper up to Sheridan, that can be a little bit nasty during the winter. But uh, classic winter fishery, particularly those uh, three miles um, from the after bay down to that three mile takeout. So uh, there's some walk weight access as well as um, drift fishing. Uh, I've seen some really, really good uh, dry fly opportunities in this particular stretch of water uh, during the winter months. Lovely, lovely stretch. Um, the Guadalupe, uh, I'm not sure if you've ever been to the Texas Hill Country, but uh, it's another option um, just that I really enjoy. If you're looking to do something a little bit different, um, place that I really enjoy. Um, go out with Chris Johnson. A lot of fun. Every day out there. I take my wife out there every year. Um, again, Chris Steinbeck and myself are going to go to Trout Fest next week, next week, so I'm looking forward to sitting out on the, on the Guadalupe. And it's funny because people often go, Trout in Texas. And that, they, have, they have a hard time comprehending that. But um, the cool thing is below Canyon Lake, um, a lot of stocking goes on in there, but they do have a year-round fishery now because they've had good flows for the last couple of years. So there are holdovers in there now, and there are wild fish um, in this particular section. Uh, classic limestone bottom. And this is a picture from last February. As you can see, you know, you're not all bundled up in down jackets, and um, you know, certainly it's much warmer down there. But there are some opportunities to catch these holdover and wild fish now in a tailwater that a lot of people are unfamiliar with. The Guadalupe below Canyon Lake. Um, some beautiful brown trout in there as well. It's just lined with cypresses. Um, classic tailwater, everything that you would fish back here, you'd fish down there. And then some opportunities to you know, catch some nice fish. If you want to go out with um, a guide, if you ever just get that you know, desire, get a hold of the folks that live in Waters Fly Fishing, Chris Johnson, good friend of ours, good friend of the shop. San Juan is another good option this time of year if you want to get away. Um, it could be cold. You know, um, I've been down there for Thanksgiving. I've been there in December. I've been there in February. Um, you know, weather patterns change all the time. You just have to kind of uh, try to prepare for the worst at certain times. But if you catch a nice mild day, uh, there are some opportunities to get in some, some good nymph fishing and some uh, good dry fly fishing. And, and here's evidence of a mild day. This is a, in the middle of February, if you can believe that. Um, Aaron Carruthers, who's a great guide, great friend of mine, if you ever want a good guide in that particular area. Um, but it, it's crazy. I mean, you, can, you can pick the right days. Look, there's not even any snow. I mean, you're in the middle of the desert, of course. But uh, 
was a, it was a great opportunity to, to spend some time with Aaron um, down there. This is uh, down near the gravel pit, certainly with some walkway options there too, uh, in addition to uh, taking float trip in there. Um, fishing back east, if you have family back east in, in North Carolina or Tennessee, um, go a little out to Watauga. It's a beautiful tailwater fishery. Um, my good buddy Matt Miles, uh, one of the coldest days of my life was this day here when I was floating with Patrick Fulcrod and Matt Miles. And I've never been so cold in my life. And then, uh, my son's moving to Asheville, so I'm really excited about getting to fish some of these areas as well. But there's some opportunities to catch some very, very nice fish on some of those eastern tailwaters. Even upstate New York, where Gary lives, on the Farmington. My son, um, Forrest, lives in New York, so I've got to go fish the Farmington, and I've really enjoyed fishing the Farmington. It's a lovely hotel water as well. So there's a lot of options close to home, some away from home. But the good news is, is you get to fish year round. You want to battle the elements, fish these teeny flies. Um, we're fortunate because there's really no season here. And I think if you use the winter season to your advantage, I think you're going to become a much better angler because it forces you to really bring your A game every single time that you go out on the river. So I'm hopeful that um, today there's a couple tips that you'll walk away with, give you some things to think about. Um, certainly, um, if you have any questions, concerns, or anything at all, certainly just drop by the shop here, email us, call us. Um, we're here for you because we want to see you succeed. Uh, one of the cool things about being a fly fishing guide is that every day when I'm out on the water, I get a fish through my customer, and that's what's cool. So when they catch a fish, I catch a fish, and that's what makes it so rewarding. I, I, I love it. I've been guiding now for almost 30 years, and I, I still love it as much today as I did when I first started. And I, you can't fake passion, and I love what I do, and that's what's really cool. So if, if I can help you guys in any way, gals, um, certainly. There's all my contact information. If you enjoy my photography, you can follow me on Instagram or Facebook. But my email, my cell phone, I'm not hard to find. Um, any of the guys here at the shop, I'm surrounded by um, <clears throat> wonderful fishermen here. These, this is a fishy group of guys that work at this store right here. And, and all is driven by passion. And so they want you to succeed as well. So thanks for sharing some time. Do you have any questions? Sir. Um, does, uh, do you see much difference? On the day when it's overcast versus the day when it's sunny, does that change the tide? Or sort of the That's a great question. So the question was uh, sunny bluebird day versus an overcast day. I, no doubt, I prefer an overcast day. I think the fish are more relaxed. I think the fishing is better. Um, the, the the hard thing though with an overcast day is the sight fishing part of the equation is tossed out because you can't see. So given the choice, I'd rather have a sunny day so that I can see, as opposed to blind fishing. But no doubt, overcast days, I think, produce better mm -hmm. than the bluebird days. Another question, the, with the flows at 180 versus whatever they normally would be at this time of year, does that mean the fish spread out more and they're harder to find, or how does that Absolutely, things? absolutely. So, uh, that's a great question. So, the question was about the above average flows and the fish spreading out, no doubt. So, uh, in a perfect world, I like 100 CFS at Deckers in the winter because there's more winter water, plus it stacks the fish together more. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. And so, I mean, we're, and we're, we can all agree, I mean, 180 to 220, that's more like a summer flow. Maybe a late summer or early fall flow. Um, higher flows means less winter water. It's harder to find those slower, softer margins, mm -hmm. no doubt about it. So, um, I suspect... Uh, with all the, the low level moisture that we've gotten in the last two weeks, I would expect that uh, Denver Water and the City of Aurora are going to begin to start to ramp those flows down. I think we're going to start to see flows getting back in that 80 to 100 CFS range soon. Um, I don't think it'll be a problem because we're starting to get longer days, warmer water temperatures, you know, are on the horizon. So. Um, Certainly, I don't want to see the flow at 100 CFS come June trying to fill the reservoir. But um, I think we got a little bit of wiggle room in the reservoir. Uh, I think, you know, we all know that the snowpack is about 140% and we're getting ready to go into the snowiest time of the year for us in the Rockies. So um, I'm not sure if you follow the flow a lot, but like uh, um, online, you can look at the reservoir storage and I look at it all the time. Denver Waters website will give you an idea on a pie graph how much <coughs> is it in the reservoirs. You can see if it's 100% or 80% or 70%. I'm always looking at that stuff. 
Uh, for instance, Cheeseman Reservoir is full at 79, 364 acre feet. I know that's full. If I look at it and it's only got 60,000 acre feet in it, then I know I know about where we stand. And I know when it's going to spill just because of all that stuff. And it's cool. I look at it that all the time. It's really cool. And I, and I try to talk to Denver Water and I try to pass that stuff on. Last question: Do you do much um, euro nymphing at this time of year, or only in the fisheries? I don't. I'm I'm strictly an indicator fisherman, but um, the guys here are really good at that, mm -hmm. and that's their cup of tea. Um, and anytime I get a, a, a euro question, I, I, I have the, the boys at the shop here, like Brian Kelso, address that. Mm -hmm. And I mean, everybody here is really good with euro tactics. Um, I'm kind of a dinosaur around here. I'm a, I'm a an indicator guy, but I, I I don't try to do something that. I'm, I'm not familiar with, or I, I'm an indicator guy. That's why I, I stick to it. And but I people just, do it at this time of year. Maybe yeah, they do. Okay. Oh, yeah. Mm -hmm. um, absolutely. Any other questions? Perhaps super cold days. Any tips for keeping those damn fingertips somewhere mm -hmm. in where you can actually feel what you're doing? I mean, you got anything that you're doing to just keep your fingertips somewhat manageable? Keeping your fingers warm, that's a tough one. I use hand warmers. Um, I always have a hand warmer in each pocket. Um, the old towel trick is good. Bring a towel, dry your hands off after you handle the fish. Um, I always, I'm always looking for that fish that does me a favor and spits the fly out in the net. That's always nice. Pinch <laughs> 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 in your bar. Oh, that's yeah. always good. You know what? And, and, and a fish comes off and he's right there and he comes off. I, I, I don't have a problem with that. I say, hey, just did you a favor. You know what I mean? It's like, but um, yeah, you know. Don't get your fingers warm. A lot of times if my fingers are really warm, I'll stick them in my buff like this. I'll put my hands down like this because you got a lot of blood moving through here, a lot of warmth right in your neck. So um, that's what I do a lot of times. I just put my hands just like that. I try to warm my hands up really quick. But, um, those, are, those are a couple things, but uh, let's get real. It's cold. It's tough. It's brutal. Um, and it, it's a tough time of year. But again, if you can go out and catch two, three, four fish, it's pretty darn cool. It's pretty blood. I think there's a question back here. What's happened on the moon, Pat? The river's almost really sterile. Um, John, who's the biologist there, um, you know, he, he's uh, he's got he's got a, his, his hands full. Um, you know, there was illegal stocking of uh, pike in, in uh, Green Mountain. Um, <coughs> Bill lice with the kokanee. Um, the blue is just certainly lost its designation. Um, but they're going to try to get that to come back. That's a goal of his. Um, as is the Williams Fork, because he's that biologist out there. But just, I asked him that this fall. I said, what's, what, what's going on with the blue? He said, it's just sterile. You know, it's a tough river. It's a lot like the North Fork. There's just not a lot of aquatic life. Um, and, um, you know, it, it's, uh, when you really look at the blue, it's either flowing at 100 CFS or 2,000 CFS. Have you ever noticed that? And so it's never really ideal. And that's a big problem, um, because it, it's more so a water conduit um, than it is a, a trout fishery, so um, that's a big problem. But the blue, um, the blue is one of my favorite fisheries, and um, you know you got the migratory component coming in the Green Mountain. Um, certainly, there's still fish there, but it's not as good as it was back when I grew up. You know, back in the 80s and early 90s, the blue was amazing. It's a great, yeah. great river. Um, but no, don't give up on the blue. I think we're working towards um, improving it. Um, certainly. The, the nice thing, like what's going on with Bighorn now and what's going on with Blue is, um, you know, you can go down to Palmer Gulch and there might be one or two cars down there and you can still go catch a half a dozen fish, um, but nobody else is around. And that's, that's, there's something to be said for that, I think. <coughs> um, hopefully that answers your question. Yeah. But, um, I'm, I'm, I'm fortunate, you know, that I got to know John Ewart pretty well on the Williams Fork um, restoration project. He probably... Um, I got on a little bit about that one, but we got to know each other pretty good on that one because they did that big restoration project last year, and that's when I had an opportunity to ride up there with him and, and talk about that stuff. You know, it was cool. So. How'd they do? The restoration? Yeah. <coughs> the jury's out on that one. Certainly, uh, from a biologist standpoint, I think he's done a good job. He's created a lot of habitat, particularly for the winter. I think so. You know, they're going to start stocking hoofers in there real aggressively um, next spring. So that should come back as a, as a rainbow trout population. How is the Blue River below Green Mountain? Uh, pretty good. It's a decent fishery. Um, certainly very flow dependent. Um, short wedge below the dam itself. Um, tough place to go this time of year. 
but um, you know, if the flow is less than 300, it's not a bad place to be. Pretty, pretty decent round trout population. I saw that question. Yeah, slightly off topic, but still fishery, fishy related. But what, when do you recommend going up to like um, um, Wind's Fork um, River that flows into the confluence of the Colorado up there? You fished up there before? It, uh, this time of year, I think Mr. Diggs is, oh, he's still over there. Remember that trip? Remember that trip, John? We went in there in February? We went in there in February. <laughs> and uh, there was three feet of snow in that, and you know it was one of those deals where you'd walk three steps and poof, up to your knee, you know, and you're like dying, getting in there. But we got in there, and the fish, fish were boiling, and I am not exaggerating, rising on midges in mid February. Okay. Boiling. It was snowing in your kitchen. Yeah. So it's actually pretty good this time of year. Though. It can be very good this time of year, and it gets very little pressure. But getting in there is the biggest challenge. Yeah. Snowshoes is not a bad idea. It's like a mile. <laughs> yeah, you definitely would the best bet is to come in from the partial area and, and yeah. walk the snowshoes up into there. And once you get to the river, it's not a problem. But yeah, okay. it's pretty good. Now, keep in mind, above the confluence of the Wings Fork, it's frozen. Yeah. And it's only open for a short distance right. down. It's, in Colorado, it's more like a tailwater at that point. Mm -hmm. And then another question for you when, when does the sound fly hatch usually start on the Colorado River up there? Depends upon what, ta what part. Uh, you know, it can be the third week of May on the lower river. Bob Dye is probably your best bet to talk to about that. But um, everything, and then it can, and it just moves its way right on up. Everything can vary um, based on uh, water temperatures, um, flows, and those kind of things. And, and the salmon fly is one of the hardest things to hit. Yeah. You know, you can hit it on June 5th. That's a rumor. And you book the trip next year for June 5, and then it's early, or it's late. Or it's really hard. Very, very short you just need to, when the bugs are on the water, you got to be able to go. That's the best thing on salmon fly hatch, it really is. Bob Dye's is who you said. Bob Dye's our lead float guide, and he okay. wrote the book on the Colorado River. Middle. Okay. So okay, that'd be Thanks. the best bet. Yeah. Any other questions? Sir. So when I fish with the real small drives, I have a hell of a time seeing them on the water. I just don't see well. Usually I'll put a bigger fly as an attractor. Do you have any rules of thumb or guidance on how large an attractor might be before it's too big and would turn off fish or unnerve a fish to the small to your smaller one? Great question. Everybody hear that about yeah. the uh, locator fly? I mean, um, I'm not going to kid you. I mean, I have a hard time seeing a, fly, a small fly no, anymore. I can't see them at all. Um, you know, 26 atoms or 24 atoms. I'll tell you one thing that really helps me is I use frog staining and I paint the top of it white. So even like a 26 Adams, if I paint the top of it with frog staining, it, it, I can see it. Does that make sense? It's got the little applicator brush and that works very, very well. Now, getting back to your question, a size 16 or an 18 high vis Griffith gnat with a bright cerise pink post is perfect for what you're describing and what I would call a locator fly. Okay, so I mean, it's, a, it's just something that I can see I trail my smaller fly behind it. If anything rises around my locator fly, I'm going to assume they took my fly. And size 18 is perfect. And you'd be surprised. I, I've, I've had that happen before. Um, I can remember one time I was on the bighorn, and I was in the middle of a betis hatch. And this is a little off topic because of the time of year. But I was in a very high glare situation, lots of duns in the water, but I couldn't see my fly. I was having difficulty seeing my fly because of the high glare situation. So I had been tying um, parachute, high vis parachutes in my uh, tying demos and uh, in a size 16. And so I did it because I wanted my people that were watching me tie to be able to see the fly better. And so I just took that locator fly and I put it on it and then I had my sparkle done behind it. And they kept eating the size 16 parachute. It's great. I only had three of them. With me. And I had three buddies with me, so that was fun. But, um, but anyway, so I went home and I tied a bunch of 16s. But, you know, I'll have them come up and eat a size 18 Griffith gnat. It's not too big that they still won't eat it as a cluster. You know what I mean? So, and if you've, if you've never uh, thrown one of those, um, they're very easy to see, even, even in foam mats and high glare situations. Uh, <coughs> Griffith gnat is really a, it's a good one to have. Fly. Very easy to, to tie to. Any other questions? I hope you guys enjoyed yourself. Thank you very, very much. Uh,